Uh, I'm here today to, to, to really present some thoughts on how to future-proof your vessel using flexible and uh, scalable energy storage to meet the demands of not just today but also tomorrow. Um, the marine sector has gone through sort of a number of stages. It's gone through the age of sail, uh, steam, oil, and about 10 years ago we, we entered into the age of electricity as uh, the medium for, for moving your, your, your vessel. And over those 10 years or so, we've made a lot of strides. Um, in fact, it's um, about between 75 and 90% of new build vessels now are incorporating energy storage uh, within them. But within the marine sector, um, there are some, some key things that we need to consider because obviously the investments involved are very significant. Um, vessels last for a long time. Uh, 20, 30, 40 and 50 years. Um, technology is evolving all the time and uh, bottom line is no one wants to make a decision today which could result in that asset being stranded in the near future given the changes in policy and as I mentioned technology. So I'm going to turn to sort of the agenda now and um, I'll, I'll outline sort of the basis of, of, of what we'll discuss during the course of this presentation. So what I thought I'd do next is, is touch upon a few key topics. I thought I'd touch upon the emission trends and uh, the impact that that has for us all. Uh, how to actually then get the best return from your investment in energy storage in, in, your, in your vessel. And, and, and the general direction of travel that we're seeing with regards to zero emission uh, usage of, of shipping in the inland waterway and other, and other areas, the charging uh, systems required, and also some of the um, steps and evolutionary changes that are happening to energy storage to provide very flexible solutions to meet the demands that you have uh, on, on your different vessel classes. So the pace of change of decarbonisation is accelerating. Uh, the, the EU GHG strategy is, 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 is imposing the need for ships to reduce their emissions by 40% in the next 10 years. There's also policy changes with regards to um, increasing the price of, of fuel oils by having a levy on that. And, and many, many port cities are imposing additional requirements for for zero emissions. And this is this is all in addition to what's been happening with IMO legislation, regulation, the Paris Accord, and, and, and initiatives led by um, carbon neutral cities alliances, for example, um, where you've seen you know clear goals from ports in LA to ports in Portsmouth uh, with a with a stated zero emission goal. And you've had the port of Oslo with a, with a zero emission goal for 2030 and Rotterdam for 2050. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, the, I suppose the direction of travel is very clear for us all. We have to clean the marine industry up. So when we first um, set about um, the, the, on the electrification of the marine industry back in 2009, energy storage was very much seen as, as, as something for backup power. Um, now, very quickly, we, we got to a stage where at megawatt scale, we were able to demonstrate that the batteries could actually be used as the prime drive for a marine vessel. And that, and that has really resulted in, in batteries becoming adopted as something that can be used 24-7, 365 uh, as a piece of um, industrial equipment. You know, one of our hardest working, probably the hardest working uh, f uh, vessel in, 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 in Europe operates 23 hours a day and uh, 364 days a year and this particular vessel carries 8 million people and one and a half million cars and so what we've seen is the acceptance of, of energy storage as an industrial application and it's, it's very exciting to see how, how the experiences in Northern Europe now are, are tr transcending continents and we're, we're doing more and more projects all over the world in lots of different asset classes. So what you see here are some renderings of, uh, of our system. So on the left is, is kind of the building block uh, of where we start. It's kind of like the Lego brick, if you will. Now, this, uh, this form factor, this look, has multiple different cells that we can utilize depending upon the client application. So, you know, DP2 application, for example, would need perhaps an ultra high uh, power cell. 
whereas something where you're looking for time uh, would need more of an energy cell. But again, they would look the same. We just uh, changed the cells um, to, to provide that performance. Then the, the diagram on the right of that is, is really a representation of what a battery room could look like. Um, this is one beneath the deck. Obviously, we also do uh, containerized systems uh, on deck as well. But behind it all is a, is a lot of software as well, as well as a lot of hardware that, that, that allows us to be a, the safest battery in the world that uh, in our particular case prevents thermal runaway so therefore uh, doesn't require some of the firefighting equipment that, that some of our uh, other some of the other supplies may require um, but but as well as the evolution in, in kind of the industrial batteries that you see here you, you also have sort of the next step and what I'm about to show you is kind of the next step in uh, marine uh, electrification so plug and play solutions is, is another critical area of importance to decarbonize the marine sector. Um, to do that, you need a few things. You need to pack as much energy as you can into a 20 foot container. This is, this is a 20 foot container uh, because space is, is often at a premium on deck. So in our, in our particular case, just to give you an idea, um, a 20 foot regular container can fit 2.8 megawatt hours. Of, of battery of, of power into um, one one container now if we were to do a high cube so it's still got the same footprint space on deck that could actually increase to about 3.4 megawatts so there's a lot of power there now this particular rendering what you have here is uh, the power electronics as well now that's important because we we've designed and we're selling sort of the um, complete standalone grid applications on board which has got the power electronics, it's got all of the fire um, safety equipment etc in this and literally it just hooks in very simply onto the vessel once you, once you put it on top and you can lift it off and put a new one in if you want to continue a trip without waiting to recharge. So a good example of using um, containerized plug and play solutions like you just saw in the previous slide are in our waterway system. So barges like this. This is a relatively small one uh, that uh, probably carries about 20 or so uh, containers. Um, now, but others can carry 120 or so containers uh, along the major arterial waterway systems of the world. Now, by decarbonizing those, you're, you're taking effectively 120 trucks uh, off the road and reducing the pollution um, by doing that. So it has a very, very significant um, uh, implications um, to, to what we're trying to achieve uh, when it comes to emission. So containerized energy storage solutions we're seeing a lot of. Um, we, we do them as well as inland waterways. We, we're also doing them for shorter ship recharging. And, and benefits of that is also they can provide some of the core infrastructure for, for the localized port as well as uh, the, the, perhaps the port city as well for frequency response and things like that. Now shorter ships um, recharging using battery to battery charging is very good because um, what, it, what, it, what it sometimes can do is prevent the need for very expensive um, utility upgrades to bring more power down, down, down to uh, the quayside. So for example, our system um, can do 6C discharge. So what that means is your one megawatt uh, battery uh, on, in a container, for example, can give you six megawatts uh, over the course of 10 min minutes. So very, very quick uh, recharging of vessels where there's quick turnaround that's required. Now, quick turnaround is one aspect to this, but also in, in the top right-hand corner, you see, um, uh, containerized solutions which are which are very helpful for for, for things like uh, cold ironing. Uh, cold ironing is where the vessel when it's at dock is is needing to uh, provide power for its house load. Now, so depending upon the, the, the power requirements of the vessel that will determine how much power you need for cold iron but that can be very important because sometimes power uh, the electricity you utilize at port can be very expensive so this is a great way for, for fleet owners to mitigate the cost of, of cold ironing. So um, it's been quite remarkable to me how, how the pace of change for the adoption of modular systems, uh, energy storage systems, has 
gone, it's really transcended from uh, just being a ferry in Northern Europe kind of application to to ferries everywhere, to tugboats, uh, to large cargo vessels, to large uh, uh, gas carriers and bulk carriers. And, and traditionally, these kind of vessel classes that you see the pictures of here are, are classified as you know efficient. I mean, they have very efficient engines that operate pretty much continuously as they, they, they go through across the oceans. Um, but what's been amazing is um, the different uses we're finding for energy storage to provide a very strong economic rationale. Typically, again, three, two, three, four years within all these vessel classes. And what's intriguing is, you know, what we're seeing is, again, a very modular approach where we may start off for, for say, a very particular use such as gas compression or, or the reduction of usage of a diesel uh, gen set on board to something that expands over time to incorporate cold ironing and, 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 and other things like that. And, and another aspect to this is uh, we are seeing the, the coming together of multiple technologies, which is a great thing. So, for example, we're partnered with many uh, hydrogen companies and uh, um, hydrogen has some uh, some benefits in that you know over time we see hydrogen becoming basically a range extender uh, to batteries and they work very well together uh, which will and, and that in turn will allow us to, to increasingly have uh, zero carbon large vessels uh, operating across the world so there's a whole host of things that go into to, defining the size of, of what's right for the vessel when it comes to uh, energy storage. Um, as we can all imagine, the requirements for a, a ferry which, which operates between A and B on a very regular basis is very different than, say, a, an SOV operating in the North Sea in winter where there's DP requirements. Um, so we need to look at a lot of different things to ensure the, the right application is going into um, the, the, the vessel that provides the, the optimum return on investment. So we look at a whole host of things including the duty cycle, so uh, this, this includes you know, how many minutes in this, this operation or that operation, the calendar life of the actual vessel, you know, it may be a, a retrofit so we need to have an eye of, 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 of the age of the vessel. Uh, as well as the age of the battery, we, uh, we have very specific requirements of sometimes people wanting a 10-year battery or a 7-year battery, and that, that has implications as well. Uh, obviously, with liquid-cooled systems, generically, um, the ambient temperature is less important to the aging side of things because the cells are kept at the temperature that uh, is designed for them, as opposed to the, 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 the temperature of the ambient situation. And obviously, you know, if you're operating in a 40-degree ambient environment, that affects cell aging. Uh, with a with a with an air cooled system versus a liquid sy system quite considerably, um, and all these other things such as safety type type approval and flag approval considerations. So a lot of things uh, go into this. Every all of these matter when it comes to to scaling a system and uh, determining the right payback for customers. So the variables that we just uh, went through uh, to, to help determine the uh, the size of the battery. There's a lot of other things though that go into the decision making process in when, when looking to future proof your vessel. So some of the key things are you know, service, warranty, um, how how things are going to be supported. I mean I think the pandemic has also brought into sharp focus that uh, uh, local partners is incredibly important to ensure that uh, service is maintained even when, when um, transportation is challenging. Uh, and, in, and indeed a turnkey idea is, is important in other applications as I mentioned with regards to the containerized solution. And another feature is um, finance. Uh, can you offer finance solutions to help uh, in the either leasing structures or more of an, perhaps an energy services contract where you sell kilowatt hours as opposed to kilowatts. Um, which is a, another thing that, that, that we provide to customers. So there's a, there's a lot of additional features that go into the final decision, not just duty cycle, etc., which are obviously fundamental though. So what I thought I'd share with you now are some, um, some thoughts um, for you to consider on safety. Um, safety is very important when it comes to all things on a marine vessel, not just, not just batteries. Um, however, 
uh, lithium batteries have uh, a lot of energy uh, stored up in them so it's of particular importance to me and uh, and everyone in the industry so what i thought is to share these following slides just to give you uh, a little bit of insight so safety is the number one priority for, for all of us in the marine sector you know, unfortunately, there have been some battery fires in on marine vessels in Norway as well as uh, on land-based systems in, in various parts of the world. Oh, obviously, this isn't good for the industry. Uh, so I think all of our focus needs to be on working with suppliers, type approval agencies, vessel owners, operators, flag authorities, and, and really, really uh, have a continuously a continuously focus on improving the standards to ensure that only quality systems are installed so we can prevent these fires in the future. Now the simple truth of the matter is that uh, not all batteries are created equal. That's, that's kind of a truism in, in, in all industries. Um, but uh, what I thought I'd share with you now is um, perhaps some uh, a look at what a lithium battery fire uh, actually looks like. So one of the cool things you get to do when you own a battery company is to blow stuff up. So what I thought I'd show you here is, um, I thought it could be quite interesting for you to see the effects of, of what is the most extreme test you can do on a, on a lithium cell. So this is an individual cell, this isn't a battery. Within our batteries we have 24 cells. So this is the 24th of the, of the power of one battery. Um, and uh, what we do literally is drive a nail into it. It can. It It causes a short, and it causes something called a thermal runaway. And uh, anyway, you'll, you'll see the effects of that here. Now, obviously, that was one cell. Um, there are approximately four thousand of those cells uh, on a megawatt on a vessel. So that 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 was the explosive force that's capable uh, from 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 uh, NMC from lithium and all types of uh, kind of batteries with high energy. Uh, what you're about to see here is the same test conducted um, on on our liquid cooled system on our battery here. Um, so I thought it would be interesting for you to see this because. Um, the important thing about batteries are that you know you've got to choose the right cell to meet the application but it's the battery management system whether it's on the physical side or the software side which har both harnesses the power uh, to, to allow you to do what you the propulsion electric propulsion but also controls the safety okay so this is this is our um, nail penetration test and don't try this at home uh, and we are the only battery in the world that's capable of doing this and uh, it's pretty damn exciting. So as you can see, there's well within here you see um, sort of the hole uh, on the left hand side. You can actually see the nail penetration where it went in, and obviously that that, that particular cell has has had quite a dramatic effect. Now that cell went up to um, approximately 800 degrees C. Uh, the cell to the right of it, um, although you, there's a bit of soot at the top, but that cell is is next door, as I say and um, that um, remained below 60 degrees and, and is perfectly capable of continuing to operate it was not damaged at all so that's quite an amazing thing when you take into consideration what you saw Man managing the cooling is is one aspect that, that's what you saw in the previous slides but there's a whole host of other things you need to do well to ensure that you know as the cell technologies evolve uh, you've got the core infrastructure capable of managing those those new developments that uh, are ahead of us um, so and you've got to manage the risk so for our system for example one of the other features is we we're focused on monitoring every single cell uh, when it comes to the 
uh, the voltage and the temperature and that way you can you can ensure the safety of, of the vessel other systems may look at perhaps uh, aggregating uh, four six eight cells and measuring the effects of all of them as opposed to the individuals now the issue there is you know one bad cell can can be masked by five good cells until there's there's a, there's a thermal event. So you need, you need to have a lot of consideration of all of the, the risks that, that could happen and manage those to ensure things are future-proofed. So, so lastly, another aspect of, of future-proofing your vessel is ensuring the software that you're utilizing within the BMS uh, provides you with the information to manage your business in a way that you can continually improve it. So for example, our, our hardware and our software generates a lot of information which, which we use from a technical perspective uh, to when we, when we service and maintain um, um, our installations. But it also can provide the information which are valuable to, your, uh, to the captain of the vessel. For example, it can show uh, was today's operation uh, as efficient with regards to energy consumption as, as previous ones or the best ones. It can provide the information that the chief engineer may want to know with regards to what is the state of my the state of health of my battery today or what is the state of health or state of charge of that battery now. It can also provide the information to to really um, validate the decision uh, to, to go through the path of adopting energy storage. So it can provide the CEO or the CFO with key metrics such as what is the return on investment for this battery, what is the cost of that particular trip in, in dollars or euros, and how much carbon have I saved by adopting energy storage. So system monitoring is incredibly important, not just from a uh, a, a, a um, uh, maintenance standpoint but also from a performance standpoint. So thank you very much for your kind um, attention to, to the presentation. Um, I look forward to taking any kind of questions later and uh, if any of you need to contact me about anything please don't hesitate to do so on the, on the email below. Okay, thanks very much. Bye-bye.